And a lot of my students were just intimidated by reading and writing because they had you know, failed in the past and they were worried about it. And I had some quizzes on the readings and I did it too soon. And I realized, well, this isn't really working for them. So I took the quizzes and I mid, mid the second week and just said, I'm getting rid of all the reading quizzes. And we're gonna do discussion-based, looking at our readings after we've read them, close reading, then we're gonna discuss it as a class and we're gonna create our own questions that we're gonna talk about and write notes on. And it was a little risky because I gave them all the power, but it changed. It changed their learning, it changed them. They had epiphany moments. They went deeper than my students had ever gone before. They created brilliant questions. So they had to read it first, annotate the reading carefully with the close reading system they learned from me. And then they came home, wrote two questions that were like quiz questions for the reading that looked at the purpose, looked at the whole trinity of what was the author trying to say, who was his or her audience, and how were they gonna make that message come across, what style did they use? And they wrote brilliant questions, and then they, we picked them, we voted on them, they picked the best three, and then they wrote notes, and they prepared those notes with quotes, and I taught them the ice cream sandwich technique, which is they frame every quote at the beginning, at the end, with a cookie, and the middle's the ice cream, which is the quote. They always remember the quotes, but they never frame them. So I'm like, you need to, that ice cream's gonna melt on your fingers, so where's that bottom cookie? So they did, they, they learned to have a topic sentence, like the author wants us to see that children need reinforcement, and then they have the quote, and then I say, okay, now interpret that. Tell me what she's saying, put it in your own words. And then they would do that, and then I would say, now break it down, what's the, what's the message? What's the direct or implied message? And they could do it. So, what I learned quickly is, don't terrify them with the quiz. Instead, help them learn how to break it down and help them learn how to scaffold their analysis and not jump straight to, did you get it? <laughs> it's too rote, right? They, they needed to embrace the language and love it. And that's what they did. And I really don't use quizzes at all anymore. I, I start from the very first day from my icebreaker exercise in any composition class, integrating the holy trinity of critical thinking, reading, and writing, because they go together. Because every time you read, it's a dialogue. It should be a dialogue and not a monologue. And every time you write, you should be thinking about your purpose and your audience and what you want to say. So I told them, everything we learn in here is one aspect of critical thinking. And I want you always to be thinking about your thinking. So it's a big word, but metacognitive, and I talked to them a little bit about that, but mostly I just say, okay, use the detective questions. What are you trying to say? Why? How? So what? What's so what? And so one of my big classroom techniques for critical thinking is so what? And I do it playfully, and I do it a little bit <clears throat> as a coach, and I also do it with humor sometimes. I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, and so what? And they, and they just keep going deeper. It's almost like peeling an artichoke till they get to the heart of really what they want to say. And so I take critical thinking, reading and writing. We start from the very first day. I have an icebreaker exercise where I pull out random quotes from the readings we're going to read during the quarter. And I take them out of context. I don't say who the author is. I just have the quote. And I give that to them. And I put them into small groups. And I say, OK. This is what you're gonna do with this quote. You've never read the whole piece. You're gonna read it later this quarter. You have no idea <clears throat> who the author is and what the purpose is, but we're gonna take it out of context and we're gonna start with this little microcosm of the author's bigger picture. And we're gonna just show you what you can do with one sentence, one sentence. And so the first thing they'll do is um, get in the group and talk about what the quote is saying. So they first has to, have to interpret. They have to be able to paraphrase summarize what it's saying. And then they say, okay, what do you think the author's trying to say as a bigger picture? What's some of the implied possible messages? What, what, could be this, what could be the context? Even though you don't know, can you guess what the bigger picture is? And then the next one is, can you think of a parallel in your own life or in our culture that connects to this quote? And so I get synthesis in there. They don't even know what it is yet, but later they will. And I'm scaffolding from day one. And then at the end of the quarter, I show them those quotes again, and we revisit them. And they were really excited, and I show them their answers that they've created. 
And they're really excited because most of the time they were right on track. And if they weren't, they're really excited to go back and say, now I know what she was trying to do. We were way off track. And they revise that. And I think if you make a mistake, you actually learn more later when you go back and fix it. So it's one of my favorite icebreakers. When I first started teaching, even in graduate school, I was all about, I had to be in control and I had to run this class, you know, and then the longer you're in the trenches and loving it and love teaching like I do and love my students and they, they teach me and they've taught me all these years, the biggest thing I realized was the best way to learn is the same way I learned, which is I learned things like how to learn to do a comma correctly sort of by instinct when I was a student, but then when I had to teach it and explain it to someone else, then I really learned it. So I use that pedagogy in my classroom for my students. I say, if you, if you read something, you kind of get a surface level understanding. But if you have to explain it to someone else in your own words, then it's a completely different critical thinking process that happens. So I have them teach each other. I even have student teaching panels, even grammar panels. They'll teach each other the comma rules. And they always tell me, even sometimes quarters later, they'll come back and say, I still know all the comma rules because I taught that panel. So I, I just know it works. I like to raise the bar even in my, in my beginning developmental courses, even in my pre-college writing and reading courses. I, I just challenge them, but then I scaffold and coach the whole way so that they can get to those achievements. But they, they rise. I mean, they come further than my old way. They come at least, uh, I would say they're twice, twice as strong when they finish. It's amazing. I've been fortunate enough to be part of study groups in Washington State that look at students moving from one course to the next and the effect of learning communities. So I combine reading and writing. And if I'm teaching literature, I even combine that with a comp course. And I started doing that at least 20 years ago. And I find that students come farther faster in both fields. I mean, they just, they just go so much quicker and they learn so much more. I also, even at a English 100 level, which is a pre-college level, class, I even integrate a seminar process that you would do like in graduate school, but it, at their level. And it's, it's amazing what these students can do when you give them that ownership. So they own the questions that they create, they own their notes, but then when they have the discussion, they bounce off of each other and they expand their ideas and then they come back and that's when they write the paper. So instead of just jumping to writing their papers, they've had all this processing and, and scaffolding and critical thinking ideas and support, but then they have to come up with their own examples, bring in their own quotes, bring in their own parallels. Sometimes they use personal, sometimes they use modern events or current events, and it means something to them because now the, now the material is their material. They own it. I think, you know, we make the mistakes in our disciplines and sometimes in our, in our classrooms, too, of just making these artificial boundaries between reading and writing and critical thinking is one tool. And, and really, they're all tools, but they're more like a yin and a yang, where there's, every tool has a piece of the other one within it. They're not separate beings, so they're, they're all integrated. And if you separate them, <clears throat> it makes it harder for students. It's like telling them, it's like telling them that you're going to do something today, like dribbling or shooting, but you never tell them that your whole goal is basketball. So they see these isolated skills, but they don't see how they come together. And you should just start from the beginning. We're going to learn about basketball. <laughs>